It's the Paul Cryer. Paul, it is so good to see you again. How are you? Same. Doing very well, Carl, and you? Pretty good. Pretty good on this fifth Monday, where we're delighted to welcome you back to the Good Morning Portugal show. And as you could hear me saying there, the clocks went back. Gibraltar is an hour ahead of us. Uh, I don't know what that means. You're better with numbers, obviously, than I am. Uh, but here you are. No, no problems here with, with the time change or the time difference. No problem. So tell us. Um, it's been an interesting time. Uh, we thought it was fairly spicy and interesting, didn't we, in the world of uh, macroeconomics and how uh, money is moving around the world. More for some than others, it would it would appear, with the greatest wealth transfer, I suspect, in a, in a long time. And then there's us mere muggles who are trying to manage our wealth. That's what you help people with. For those people who haven't met you before and don't know what you do, why not give us a quick introduction to fidu fiduciary wealth management before we get started on those questions about yeah, money? Yeah, I mean, fiduciary wealth management was founded in 2007. We are born out of a law firm, the oldest law practice in Gibraltar, hmm. which was founded in 1892. So that's a 131 year old law firm. Wow. Um, we belong to a top 20 global accountancy network, MGI Worldwide, which is, rep which is represented by 10,000 professionals across 460 locations, 10 hundred countries, and um yeah across all continents um and and our business is all about helping british expats with their <coughs> with their financial affairs i mean we deal pr primarily with retirees uh senior executives and entrepreneurs okay let me just reiterate that then so it's it, especially brits who are yeah. making their way or have retired in the iberian peninsula which would include uh, portugal Spain and Gibraltar, where we find Correct. you this morning. Okay, um, and I love it. it you're, it's wonderful what uh, what is said over there on your web page. I'll put the link to it, dedicated to helping expats and their families. Um, so it's all about that very personal one to one service, um, which is which is looking at people's lifelong wealth management. You, you're you're in for the long term. You're into building relationships with people. Um, that's, Completely. That's, that's what people know um, FWM for, I believe. Completely. I mean, our business is all about developing, um, yeah, developing long-term, deep personal relationships with each and every client. Yeah. I mean, clients are at the center of everything we do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we are not um, fly-by-night merchants that come and go. I mean, we are completely dedicated and passionate about serving the British expatriate community across the entire Iberian Peninsula. That's who we are. That's what we do. Um, and, you know, we, we take pride in serving each and every one of the clients that we onboard. Excellent. And that's how you can get in touch with Paul, paul.correa and fwm.gi. Now, as we said, uh, Paul, this is not an easy time to be in your business, is it? I mean, it, we are a long way from the heyday, weren't we? Of like, I'll just give my financial consultant my wealth manager a ring got a bit of money to put to one side need to think about my retirement you know i've been working for 40 years i'm going to retire soon need to talk to a professional about this and those those were the halcyon days weren't they in your profession and things have become somewhat more turbulent in the last few years have they not <coughs> well they've become turbulent <coughs> since 2019 yeah and then we had brexit and then we had covid and um but you know in 2016 to 2019 in 2016 let me remind your viewers interest rates were at zero the federal reserve and other central banks started increasing rates we had a tantrum in the bond market and by 2019 that reached two three percent and then of course came brexit covid and everything else and we um, decided to um, go back to zero interest rates and to inject a lot of new money into the global economy, uh, the price of which we, we, we are paying for with, with runaway inflation. Um, so no, markets have been turbulent ever since, going up when they really should be going down. And, um, but, but now we are seeing the end game where the markets are really not going anywhere because there's no... Uh, there's tighter monetary conditions, um, high interest rates. They are 
removing excess liquidity from the monetary system and um and yeah i mean with interest rates at five something will break and the u.s economy is now on the brink of uh some kind of a slowdown at best or, or a outright recession at worst and yeah and if you look at all the asset classes it's, it's quite strange really carl if you look at it because <clears throat> the bond market now has upward sloping interest rates you know the yield is going up that implies in a normal market that the global economy is growing fast yeah that's why mm -hmm. interest rates are going up when in fact it's not the equity market is starting to decline so it's starting to point to um, some kind of a recession or a slowdown. So the bond market is saying one thing, the equity market is selling, saying another. And then if you look at um, precious mo uh, metals and commodities, and we're seeing the, a sell-off in those, that indicates that inflation is no longer a risk. When in fact, you know, inflation, inflationary pressures may have receded. But, you know, if history is anything to go by, they're coming waves of three. And I think we've seen the first wave. I don't think we're out of the woods because we, you know, if the economy breaks and there's already a spike in delinquencies, you know, in, in bad debt in the U.S., oh. if it breaks, if, if it slows down, we go back to, and I keep using the same phrase, I'm sorry, you, you bring me in after a year and you probably hear the same thing, but it's the, the junk, you know, the, the drug addict that's given more coke rather than accept uh, going cold turkey yeah we'll yeah. have lower interest rates and more monetary stimulus to keep the party going as long as possible um but no it's it's difficult times no doubt because the market is flat if yes. anything trending lower and there's no particular asset that's performing well if you, if you look at us treasuries for instance uh, they've declined 46% since 2021. That's the biggest decline in history, in US history. And this is a safe asset, yeah? If you look at UK guilds, they've declined 40% over the same period. You know, the safe bastion of UK investments. Nothing is safer than UK guilds. Well, they've gone down 40. But what's more worrying in the US in particular is if you look at US interest rates, or, or sorry, UK, uh, the 10-year treasury, bond and the yield because the 10-year treasury bond is a benchmark for lending rates yeah mm -hmm. and and that's why it's so critical and when it breaks through the five percent that normally triggers a recession but the yield is going up now the yield is going up because saudi arabia is dumping uk uh, us treasuries china is dumping us treasuries russia is dumping us treasuries and maybe they each have a reason for doing so and one of them is you don't want to hold an asset which is declining in value right why would you hold why would any government hold a, third, a can, another country's investments when it's you know losing half percent of its value right uh, but the second one is more strategic um and and more meditated and it's you know you know these countries are trying to form the brick plus plus they're trying well, i wanted to ask you about that i wanted to yeah, ask you they're about trying that. to create their own currency and and they want to put pressure on the dollar this is all about geopolitical um strategic games it's a chess game yeah and they're putting pressure but what's concerning is if they keep dumping u.s treasuries the yield will go higher we mm -hmm. know that 35 percent to 50 percent of u.s treasuries mature in the next i think 12 to 24 months Who's going to buy those treasuries, which are negative yielding assets? You know, the, the, the buyer of last resort is the U.S. Treasury. Well, if I was going to say, they'll buy, they'll, it's like the country will buy its own product, won't it? And correct. Have to, but, have to create more money to do so. And then exactly. It's, it's the inflationary cycle. Ex thank you. <laughs> you say you're not, switch, you're not switched on, but I think you're more switched on than me. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Yes. They, buy, they buy their own um, uh, treasuries. They yes. expand, the Fed expands its balance sheet again. There's more money in circulation. And we go back full circle to inflation and more debt, which is madness. So, so you know, I think the U.S. is really, um, it's got like two or three pieces in the chessboard. And and it's almost snookered now by the brick economies. And and look look at geopolitical 
politics. They've they've got a a um, they've been um, dragged into the Ukraine Russia war. They're being sucked into the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Yeah, and they're spending a lot of money to fund those. I, I think the U.S. Treasury, the 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 Senate or whatever, didn't they approve 104 billion dollars of of uh, of um, of money to Israel? So they, you know, besides running huge deficits, they are sucked into two wars: Ukraine, Russia, Israel, Gaza, stroke the rest of the Middle East, which would be insane. And then they've got Taiwan. What happens once they've run out of money? And the Chinese decide to invade Taiwan. How are they going to do it? Well, Paul, you've cheered us right up this morning. That's what um, I do. <laughs> That's well, what I do. The other part of what you do, of course, is help people in this in this scenario. Um, based on your your wealth of experience and your insight there, so that's that's the important question. I mean, my question about the BRICS nations and the end game, as you put it, can wait for a moment. You, you know, and, and for many people, of course, that, that's, <coughs> yeah, that this you know the, the recession has is already a recession for many people in the world, isn't it? It's like well, I guess what we're talking about here in in, in within our uh, privileged and um, more fortunate realms, perhaps, is that it hasn't got to some of us yet but in the way that it has to millions. Uh, billions of people around the world you know it's, it's it's interesting isn't it you know just somebody perhaps who's lost their home and job and they're hearing on the news that a recession isn't officially declared yet but it might be so well, hold on a minute some people are actually physically viscerally experiencing that in their own real life so we are dealing with that situation or some of us are already um, and and the others are concerned about that as a possibility and what to do in these circumstances. So what I what, what are you saying to people um, in these in these most challenging of times in your in your position in your industry? Well, well firstly, let me just expand on what you've said. You've hit a very uh, a very important point, and and you're absolutely right. There's a cost of living crisis. There's a recession in everything but name, because mm-hmm. you know. Statistics, lies, lies, damn lies. You know, it's it's all, you know, cooked up so it looks and it feels like it's something else. But really, there's a lot of people who are feeling, everyone is feeling the impact of this cost of living crisis, recession, call it what you may, because nothing yeah. is real anymore. But it's you're right. It's gaslighting, isn't it? It's like, you yeah. know, it's like, so, well, hold on a minute. It just feels like a, it's, it's definitely a cost of living crisis. It's a recession. People are feeling this. Their lives have been changed, some beyond recognition. It's happening. And, and like T-Duck saying, they changed the de- de- dictionary definition of recession. It sounds, it's like, oh, yeah, why bother to fix anything when you can change the language? But sorry, I um, I interrupted you there. No, I think Thunder Duck is right. Call it what you may. You can give it whatever headline and narrative you want. But I think the most people um, can feel the effects of this cost of living crisis. And it's, you know, a recession, everything but name. But look, where can we add value? I think it's never been more important for British expats in Portugal to seek a second opinion. I would say it's fundamental and it's crucial. Yeah. Um, one, why? I think because you avoid costly mistakes. Um, You are able to mitigate risk by considering varying viewpoints in order that you have a more balanced assessment of the risks and rewards out there. I think it gives you the peace of mind and the confidence that you can, you know, that you understand um, the situation and you can reduce the uncertainty about your financial future. You know, a second opinion gives you a diverse perspective and there might be different opportunities and approaches that the person has not considered. So a second opinion in this environment is crucial. Take the US, for for instance. In the medical profession, only 12% of the time is the first medical diagnosis the same as the second one. It means that 88% of the time, if the patient had gone and sought a second opinion, the medical or, or the, you know, the um, the prognosis and and the treatment plan would have been different and more and better probably. Yeah, well said. Yeah. So yeah. so this is transferable to the financial services sector. 
Uh, a second opinion, I would say, is fundamental in a market like this where no one really knows where we're heading. And yeah. that's why we keep insisting gold and silver. Be patient. It might take longer, but it's the only asset which will preserve value over the long yeah. term. Yeah. So second opinion, run the numbers, I suppose, is one another way of putting it, isn't it? Don't make assumptions based on your current situation. And and we're seeing this, aren't we, with um with the NHR at the moment. I'm sure you felt the repercussions of that decision. <laughs> that was that must have been quite an awkward uh, morning to go to work on um, when the, uh, the forward prospects of your many of your clients will have been affected by that, I suspect. But the immediate reaction for most people, as with most things, I suppose, is an emotional one. And you don't really know the full impact, do you, until you run the numbers and, and have the second opinion or the third or whatever, however many opinions you have. But it's but it's good to get rational and look specifically at the maths, isn't it, rather than just going on your <coughs> old, old bit of seaweed or your first emotional reaction from, you know, drummed up drama in the media, for example. So a good advice. So to take a second look. And uh, you, 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 of course, reference as, as we as we know you do, and, and which seems to be a tried and trusted method. The precious metals are very um, important to you, and it's part of the uh, of the of the game plan. And it's not a game. Sorry to use that phrase. I would say cash is king, and some commodities at some point, maybe it's worth buying some bonds. But but it's difficult to find an asset that's going to deliver the returns that you're looking for if you take a short term view. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's uncertain times. I mean, the closing down is not just NHR. I mean, Italy has now followed suit, came out with a press statement that they're going to tinker with their tax regime in Portugal on the back of what, uh, sorry, in, it in Italy, on oh, the really? back of what Portugal is doing. Yeah, The yes. European U Union is squeezing those citizens citizenship by investment programs in the Caribbean and in other countries to try and, you know, close them down if they may, because they give visas into Europe. So, you know, there's nowhere yeah, to hide. Governments want more tax revenue and they don't care how they do it. Yes. And they, they I mean, you, your advice to the individual is not to take a short term strategy because it can be very costly. That's the opposite of what governments do, isn't it? Governments, by definition, are short term thinkers, aren't they? Because they've only got five years. If if they're um, if they're uh, the unluckiest scenario, I guess, is, um, you know, a, a few years. Uh, with a five-year term, for example. So they do things that aren't going to be long-term by by definition, really, because of the way politics works. And you see this, don't you? I mean, Spain, I heard Spain talking about, uh, ah, OK, so Portugal have dropped their NHR. We'll come up with something. We'll, in, we'll entice taxpayers over here. And then we see, don't we, long-term, that's not they're not going to remain generous, are they? They're just going to do things that attract you quickly and, and sort of turn your head. But they're, they're, their best interests are not with you, let's face okay. it. I'll give, you two, I'll give you two examples in Spain. Sure. First, yeah. <clears throat> 12 months ago, the Spanish, the Andalusian right-wing government scrapped Spanish wealth tax in Andalusia. Two weeks later, the national government imposed a national law, which hasn't gone, hasn't been approved yet from what I understand, scrapping mm -hmm. regional wealth tax and applying a uh, Spanish wealth tax at a national level. Yeah. So more tax. That's one. The second thing they've done post-Brexit is that they've applied a new tax ruling for uh, non-EU pension transfers into Spain, which really is aimed at Brits only because, you know, how many other nationalities move in to Spain in huge numbers? And if you transfer your UK pension to Spain, they tax you up to 46% of the value at inception. And then whatever is left over, they tax you on any income you draw. Can you imagine the lunacy, harebrained idea of doing that? And we've seen it in Portugal. The, you know, they wanted to scrap Golden Visa due to, you know, it's putting pressure on uh, uh, property prices for Portuguese nationals. You know, wh why didn't they decide to create a fund for social housing where yeah. people applying for Golden Visas could just invest in that fund, which then funds, you know, the government to do those projects. And it's a win-win. Why would you close uh, it down? That, you know, it's madness. Eminently sensible. Your your uh, your your uh, usual and much appreciated common sense approach, Paul. That that would be a perfect marriage, wouldn't it? Attract investment and give the people the benefit of the of the investment you've attracted. It's, I mean, it absolutely is. It just <laughs> yes. What? Because 
<laughs> yeah, um, that would make a lot of sense. But I guess um, by the time they've created a system where they can reappropriate inward investment into social housing, um, they're miles away, aren't they? These, these, the, again, it's a long-term strategy, isn't it? The, the likes of which is unlikely to be seen by any um, government who or politician who might have another agenda, uh, of which I, we needn't speak about right now. But I, you know, they're not long-term. And they seem to be quite self-interested, our current bunch, don't they, around the world of um, politicians. Um, well, if we can talk about BRICS a little bit, that'll be great. However, before we do that, um, yeah, they'll just print more. That's uh, Gene's uh, response for when the United States need more money to fund things. They'll just print more money. Can't go on forever, can it? The US can't protect their borders or help their own citizens, but they can finance wars and government employees. Yeah, go governments can often find money for wars, can't they, strangely enough? Um, when they were telling people up until that point, no, there's no money. Uh, they changed the dictionary de definition of research. We saw, uh, sorry, re recession, what we're talking about. Um, why bother to fix anything when well, you can change the language? There's a lot of that about at the moment, isn't there? A recession is, this is very poignant. A recession is when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose your job. Um, that's that's pretty chilling, isn't it? But but there's a lot of um, sort of common sense in that as well. A recession used to be, is this the old fashioned, is this the old fashioned definition, Paul? No, that, that is the current definition. But but uh, I found that Dak is, is, his comments are on the money as well, as well as, <laughs> yeah. as the lady before. before yeah, he that likes that. you too. It's he true. You that, too. that is the official definition. But hey. What is a recession these days? Eh? The current definition is whatever Biden's handlers say it is. And to be um, fair, it's, I mean, that we can apply that to all politicians, can't we? They're uh, economic handlers and all, whether, whatever handlers they have. Uh, tell them what to say, don't they? I'm not sure many of them completely understand these the nuances anymore. They're not learned people. I don't know if I'm mistaken, Paul, in thinking that once upon a time politicians were quite learned and, and reflective and might uh, do a bit more George or rather than war, war, as it were. Uh, we don't seem to have that caliber of uh, politicians anymore. But again, let's not get sidetracked by that. Uh, let's see what other people are saying. Amazing approach. Nunu also approves of your um, your shares this morning. Uh, your sharing, not your financial shares or your share tips, but your <laughs> the sharing of your message this morning. Amazing approach, Paul. I don't massage the figures. The Federal Reserve and politicians do that. And Paul, from Pete, there is a big difference. Oh, you've, you're the first of our Pauls today, Paul Carrera. We have Paul Wood. Paul Woods, artist, joining us uh, in the second half of the show as well. Uh, Paul, there's a big difference between this Paul, Paul Carrera, fiduciary wealth management, between physical gold and silver, um, something that has been oversold on an index. I'm yet, I'm still yet to find a good bullion dealer in Portugal. Any advice? That's a great question. <coughs> and he's right, isn't he? I mean, having it, holding it is more important than a certificate, is it not? Well, I mean, I think uh, he mentions a very good a valid point because you know the the rumor in the market is if you look at the um at those f f um futures trading in 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 um in certificates they have highly leveraged so perhaps they have one bar of gold in in a, you know stored away and they leverage that six times, ten times. So it's almost like a like a Ponzi schemes, yeah. If no, suddenly, it uh, isn't so. <laughs> if everyone wanted to, you know, take their their physical gold, I don't think you know it's over leveraged. So he's got a good point. It's always ideally you would buy physical, yeah, and you store yeah. it somewhere safe, and then there's no doubt you've got the physical gold. Yes, but you know, I th I I think there's money to be made in in trading, um, you know, either funds or leveraged funds over the okay. long term, but do not you, short term. Do you know of a good bullion dealer in Portugal? Is the question? I have no idea. Well, we, I think I, the I, best thing is to to no, mine I, it. The, the, mine the it answer yourself. is no. Okay, thanks, uh, Paul, for that. Ken is saying Pete has the land for physical gold. What for mining? Is there going to be a new Portuguese gold rush around Pete's house? Um, perhaps I don't know. Great to have Paul on the show. Both of them, yeah, Paul Correa and Paul Woods uh, today on the show. And um, who needs taxes? This is an interesting question. So this and bricks, I'll ask you about Paul, if I may. Who needs taxes when you can just print more? Taxes are all about behaviour control. Now, whether or not that's true. You could, a child could be forgiven for thinking, well, hold on a minute, mummy and daddy. The government can print money. Why are they taking tax off you when they could just print money and give it to you? Why do we have to have taxes when we can just print money, Paul? 
to, to it's fund good, um, it's a good question isn't it <laughs> it's a good question because money you know has to be paid at some point and taxes yeah. is 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 government receipts well, can they just take that source can they just print it and then hold it and use it to spend on things like roads you know the usual things people talk about with tax social welfare roads but, but, airports can't yeah, they just but, print but, it and... but if you think about it <clears throat> if you print money you're effectively issuing a debt instrument Yes. That debt instrument requires investors, yes. and it requires, you know, and there's a debt servicing cost, and it needs to be repaid at some point. Yes. So, okay. I mean, that would be, um, you know, the debt would 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 then spiral completely out of control, and money would lose its its intrinsic value. Okay. Um, so, yeah, in a normal situation, you know, revenue and and expenditure should should balance. Yeah. Sometimes okay. you have budget surpluses, sometimes you have deficits. You know, in the modern era, in the last, I don't know how many years, deficits has be, have become normalized. Mm -hmm. But, you know, no, deficits are deferred taxation. Someone will have to pay for that at some point. Maybe it's a question for your old nemesis, Kate, who used to join us and say that, you know, you could just print more money. But, the, you know, there are limits to that, aren't there? And, and, and it's a very fascinating conversation to have. But there are limits to just this ceaseless printing of money, which you've talked about, which leads us back to the BRICS countries who are unloading their trust of the dollar by the sound of it and perhaps are creating their own currency, uh, some sort of BRICS token. Interestingly, in the new, newfangled way, of perhaps a digital currency. Um, what do you make of that, generally speaking, Paul? What are you hearing about that? No, I think that they're going to create their own currency, digital or otherwise, probably digital. And it's going to be backed by gold and silver, by precious metals, like pre Breton Woods 1971, where, you know, governments had to have an equal amount of gold in their vaults to lend or to borrow against. Um, I don't think they'll go to that extent, but but I think the this digital brick uh, currency will be backed somewhat by gold, and this should be a massive um, boon for gold and silver because you know it means that <coughs> all the countries forming part of this new digital currency will continue increasing their um, holdings of precious metals. Um, and they already have. You've seen the trend, not just the BRIC countries, but across the globe. Um, most central uh, banks increasing, um, gov sorry, governments increasing their their stocks of gold, uh, their holdings of gold over the course of 2022 and indeed 2023. Interesting. So, yeah, they're, they're going to be coming forward with with the you know new all singing, all dancing digital currency. When in fact, really, our, the way we trade our current money is digital anyway, isn't it, largely speaking? But this is going to be a proper digital currency. However, unlike our current money system that we're using, that we trust, and we, from which the dollar, upon which the dollar is based, there will actually be something backing it, um, some some tangible asset in, in, um, in, well, not in Fort Knox, in this case, other, <laughs> the equivalent thereof in other countries. Paul, always amazing to talk to you. Thank you for being here. That's how you can get in touch with Fiduciary Wealth Management. That's the website there. Um, is there a final word you would like to share with our listeners this morning? It's been so great to have you back. I hope you'll come back in future. Thank you. I will. Uh, any message? Yeah. Uh, yeah, pray. <laughs> and then call Paul. <laughs> and then call you. Exactly. I'm your yeah. saviour. Yeah. <laughs> While you're on your knees, reach for your phone. Thank exactly. You, Paul. Give Paul a shout exactly. Ho hopefully they'll do it before they're on their knees. Yeah, yes. they've got the wisdom and the courage to pick up the phone because it doesn't cost anything to get a second opinion and to make sure that their assets are uh, as secure as they can be in this environment. And Excellent. you know, don't leave it to chance because I think the volatility moving forward can get a lot worse than we've seen, yeah, and okay. it's to the downside potentially. Thank you for your sage advice. Pete saying China bought an awful lot of gold. The thing is silver is far easier to convert. Great guest. Thank you. Uh, cheers for that, uh, T-Duck, uh, for that as well. So, Paul, excellent to see Thank you. you. Um, look for, looking forward already to uh, your next uh, appearance here on a Good Morning Portugal. Have a great day, great week in Gibraltar. And say hi, Thank please, you. to the FW team from me, if you will. Take care, mate. Bye for now. Thank Big you, Carl. Take care. Bye.
There he goes. Paul Correa there of Fiduciary Wealth Management.